Okie dokie, and with that, um, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to our next panel. We have uh, Neil here with the robotic glockenspiel, which we finally get to know better. <laughs> um, have fun and go at it. Thank you. My name is Neil. Uh, I have a young daughter, and she's what started this whole process. So that was my first attempt at a uh, robotic glockenspiel. Uh, I learned a lot, uh, learned a lot how not to do it, and so then I created the robotic glockenspiel X, or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> this is my second version, and uh, I'll give it a spin here, and then we can talk a bit about how it runs. So you can see that the first problem that I had with, the, uh, with Beverly's glockenspiel is it had eight notes. And there's a limited nut set of tunes that you can play in eight notes. No matter how you transpose it, there's stuff you just cannot do. So I wanted to go bigger, and I picked up this 25-note uh, glockenspiel uh, used on eBay, and then built the rest of the machine around it. Uh, start it running while we explore it. It uses the same solenoids that uh, the earlier one does, uh, except in order to get rid of the metal-on-metal uh, metal clanging sound, there's now hemispheres of wood uh, on the top of the solenoids, and the whole thing is coated with rubber. 
Uh, that's uh, a trick that uh, Martin was using for his um, uh, glockenspiel as well. Put this back. Here's the underside of it. Over on this side, we've got a Raspberry Pi. It's got uh, 26 GPIO pins, which is just perfect for a 25 bell glockenspiel. And then each of the uh, GPIO pins goes to a MOSFET uh, for amplification, and then directly to the solenoid on the other side of the board. Uh, didn't need any shift registers. Uh, it's all worked out well. The solenoids run for uh, eight milliseconds. Uh, that's all they need to get launched up. Uh, any more, and they hit the bottom of the, uh, uh, the bells and dampen the music because they're holding there. So uh, eight milliseconds is the maximum, and any less than that, and they don't have enough velocity to reach the bells. So it's a very fine tolerance, but it seems to work out consistently across all of them. Um, the solenoids use a fair amount of current, and the power supply that I've got is just a tiny wall wart. So the real heroes of this uh, are these two capacitors down here that are doing all the heavy lifting. Uh, much of this is made up of scraps from uh, bits and uh, projects that I already had, things lying around. Uh, the main board is uh, an offcut from our dining room table when I built that. Uh, the terminal block here is from the uh, Deutsche Bahn when they uh, stripped out all their electromechanical uh, relay-based signaling systems and uh, replaced it with computer-based system back in 88, so that was in West Germany. Um, and it's, uh, I've never figured out what to do with all those amazing relays, but uh, terminal blocks are useful. Uh. Uh, the fun part, in my opinion, is in the software. Uh, I am a software engineer at Google, so this is what I do. Um, the software is, oh, let me try going over to this one. There we go. The software allows you to program your, uh, program your tune rather than compose it. Uh, Music is mathematics, and computers handle mathematics very well, especially repeating. So here's a simple tune. And we can change the uh, notes, make them shorter. And this is a programming environment, so we'll put loops around it. Uh, let's play this four times. Run it, and then we can play it on the glockenspiel. I think it sounds better on the glockenspiel than on the computer because the uh, percussion of the uh, uh, solenoids adds a certain beat to it, which I like. Some people say it's a bug, but uh, whatever. bug feature. <laughs> um, this uh, programming environment, this is Blockly. This is the project that I work on at Google. Uh, it's the uh, uh, library that powers Scratch and Code.org and Made with Code and all the other ones. Uh, if it's block based, it's probably using uh, Blockly underneath. Uh, we've got uh, functions and variables and lists and math blocks. If you can figure out how to create music dynamically using a square root block, I'd like to hear from you. Um, but if this is not enough, you can always switch to JavaScript. And here is what we just wrote, but this time in JavaScript. And you can use all the features of that language. Uh, I'm going to show you how uh, coding can make music more interesting. Uh, this is Frère Jacques. We'll just play it as it is on the. So this is a long program, basically what you'd get if you were to load this in from a MIDI file. Uh, well, there are repetitions, like quite a few of them. So let's exploit that. Uh, da, 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 da. That's this part. 
repeat twice. So now we can take these four and throw them out. And then we'll get another repeat. That's uh, set that to two, and we'll need two more of them. Uh, da, 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 there we go. There's the next bit. And what do we got here? Uh, da, da, da. Nope. Right, that's the bit that we can throw out again. You can throw it a lot once you understand how loops work. Da, 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 da. There we go. There. Take this out, that out, that break it apart, throw away both of these. And if all went well, we now have a much smaller tune. Now we can have more fun with this. Let's throw all of that into a function. Uh, we'll call it tune. And then we'll take function call. So no change so far. And let's add a second voice and some rests to offset it. Uh, I think that's the right number of rests. We'll see. And we can play that in the glockenspiel properly. So it can currently play up to eight notes at the same time. Uh, that's pretty much an arbitrary limit. I'm not sure what the maximum number of notes is before it uh, depletes the uh, capacitors and browns out the computer and it resets. Uh, but I figure that if you're playing more than eight notes at a time on a 25-note glockenspiel, you're probably doing something wrong. So I think eight is probably a good limit. Um, which leads us to the next point, which is I'd like to put this on public display, say, in the lobby at Google, so that people can play with it, um, either when they're waiting there or remotely, because anybody can go to glockenspiel.appspot.com, uh, including the people watching here live or at home. Hint, hint. And it will play here. So have fun with that. We'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, but the problem is that if this is put in a public area, you've got a spam problem. So somebody's going to come along and repeat the same note a thousand times and then play it. And that's going to be really annoying. Da -da 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 -da. I don't need a doorbell in my life. Uh, now, the good news is there's a big red button right there, reset button. You hit that, it just dumps whatever it's playing and moves on. Um, but I would prefer that sort of thing not to be uh, played in the, first, in the first case. So the question is, how do you write an algorithm that can filter out music and not music? Or in other words, how do you algorithmically define music? Does that sound like a hard problem? <laughs> it does to me. Uh, these days, the most popular way to do something like that would be to train a neural network. Uh, basically say, I don't know, let the machines figure it out. And that's certainly one possibility. But then I'd need training data. Well, there's lots of training data for music. Uh, the problem is there's a lot of non-music that is of different types, like one repeating note, uh, random notes. Um, how do you define where the boundary is? That's an interesting problem. Uh, another potential problem, and this is where we get into legal areas, uh, disclaimer, I am not a lawyer. I am a software engineer. Oh, 45 minutes. Does the Westminster Chimes. Um, 
So what happens if somebody's at home and they uh, compose Coldplay and then uh, play it on the glockenspiel that's sitting in a corporate lobby somewhere? Does that qualify as a public performance? We don't have a cover license. So could that get us into trouble? And this is something, this is the sort of thing that matters to a large corporation because, you know, we have partnerships and it, it, it matters. Uh, small organizations don't have to worry about it. But um, now we have to figure out possibly do we need to filter the tunes against a known database, a content ID database, and filter out anything that's still in copyright? And what is in copyright? Like, happy birthday, finally, is no longer in copyright, but do we have that sort of thing up to date? Uh, and what happens if you transpose the music so that it can't be, uh, and, and if you fold octaves down, can you always pick it up? Uh, so that's the sort of problem that uh, is where software engineering collides with legal matters. And again, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know how far you'd have to go with this, but that's the sort of thing you have to think about. Um, do you have any questions? Anything I can, any questions about how this works? Well, with that, I will leave you with a tune that I think some of you might recognize. to say that pretty much every piece of music that Wintergarten makes plays really well on the Glockenspiel. Not everything does, but uh, Wintergarten is just a gold mine of great tunes for Glockenspiel. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, what an amazing project. Uh, it was also nice to see your daughter just being like, ooh, <laughs> it plays itself. Somebody's using it. <laughs> uh, very interesting project. And I think. Um, the legal question is actually really hard to solve. Uh, I always see it um, in documentaries, even re up to recently, where they pick apart popular pop songs, where it's like, well, actually, this is not a new melody. This is from like 1950s. It's just played backwards, so this should be sued. <laughs> it's very, it's it's a very tricky question, and I I feel like unless you have like a master's degree in this specific field, you can't even think about it. Um, yeah, with that said, thank you so much for your talk. It was very, very interesting. And um, are you going to bring it back in Hall 2? Yep. So we can hear it more? Yep. Nice. Okay, everybody, one more round of applause, please. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And then we are preparing the next talk now.